Hi everyone, it's me. And today, let's be understanding. We are going to talk. PewDiePie's mistake. So what do you get when you roll up a bunch of Let's Play videos into puff pastry and bake at 400 degrees? A PewDiePie! <laughs> alright, alright, that joke was terrible. Here, let me try another. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome to Film Theory! Um, yeah, so, hello internet, welcome to Film Theory. Hello. The theorist channel that thankfully remained untouched by PewDiePie until today. Aw, it's like a rite of passage for a theorist channel. Now, you don't have to be a fist-bumping member of the bro army to have seen the media firestorm surrounding PewDiePie over the last week. From Dis- Um, this video came out in year 2017, so... A significant portion of time have passed. Let's be understanding and let's go over it. Learn from the mistakes and people learned from this kind of mistakes. Disney and Maker dropping him to YouTube cancelling season 2 of Scare PewDiePie to media outlets and alt-right groups declaring him a racist and anti-Semite and a hero to all Nazi kind. Now before I go any further, I should mention that this episode is gonna go to some dark places. We'll be talking about things, or more accurately, we'll be talking about other people talking about things that many people, myself included, find offensive. Um, yes. This is this video is going to be very touchy, in a sense. Quite sensitive. It's kind of the point of the episode, but TLDR, if you get triggered easily or can't approach a thoughtful, rational discussion in an objective way, and are immediately going to get offended if I say something that doesn't align with your personal belief system, well then, this episode is not an episode for you. Once, once again, I have to reiterate again, say it one more time, please remember to be understanding. Please remember to be polite, respectful, and be a decent human being to society. Well, actually, it is the episode for you. It's probably most important for you to watch it. But if I know the internet, you'll probably have some huge knee-jerk overreaction midway through and completely miss the point. So, uh, just... Try not to do that. Just want a logical discussion here. You can get mad afterwards. Now, because I believe in context in situations like this, unlike some people, <coughs> WSJ, let me outline the situation for clarity, oh. even though you've probably heard it like 15 times by now. Most of the backlash can be traced to a couple recent PewDiePie videos. In one, he uses the online freelancing website Fiverr to hire two men in India who say they'll write anything on a sign and dance with it. So, he asks them to write Death to All Jews, subscribe to Keemstar on a sign, and guess what? They do. PewDiePie reacts thusly. I am sorry. I didn't think they would actually do it. I feel partially responsible, but just I didn't think they would actually do it. His follow-up video to that one features a guy who looks and dresses like Jesus who'll say anything that he's paid to. And PewDiePie featured a video of him saying, Jesus here. Just want to let you all know that Hitler did absolutely nothing wrong. Now, out of any context, these are obviously horrible sentiments. But the refrain of PewDiePie and his defenders is that they were supposed to be taken as jokes. And let me make my thoughts perfectly clear on this issue from the outset. I Oh, funny. I believe Felix when he says that. I don't think he meant to do anyone any harm or to condone cruelty or anything like that. Rem Understandably, um, proper and appropriate jokes is great. But for which audience? have basic decency and I understand that it's very good to be open-minded but case in point if a majority a huge a huge majority of individuals think that your joke is not funny it's offensive it is offensive Removing all context can make anything look bad if you have enough material to work with. I mean, heck, if you watch this channel regularly, you know that I've talked about satanic rituals, blowing up cities, and nuclear warfare enough times to leave myself open to one mighty incriminating supercut. I joke about it all the time on GT Live. There are so many quotes out there that'll prevent me from becoming president. That little guy was getting ballsy, but now I'm sucking his balls. Hmm. Or, I suppose, maybe not. And let me also be clear, I am 100% on Felix's side when he talks about how much the media has railroaded him, shortchanged him, and generally been a huge steaming pile of turd to online personalities. In fact- Now that's crossing the line. There's a saying in Chinese called 对事不对人, 
We talk about the situation, we talk about circumstances, we talk about the problem. We do not talk about the individual who caused it. We do not talk about individuals who was involved in this. We do not talk about it. The the person who, who is victimized was a corporate. We don't talk about it. We talk about the situations. We focus on it. We focus on the situation, not on the on not the person. Right? That was making that Gongzi Ren uh rant videos about it, defending Felix two years ago, before it became the cool thing to do. How dare you make fun of PewDiePie! Hashtag called it! Oh, oh my god, you're so young. But oh then there's gosh. that other one I just did about how the media just outright lies all the time, so I would say my stance is pretty well established there. Now, those aren't the issues I'm most interested in today. Today, I aim to answer what differentiates a good joke. Aw, oh, what's his name? His name is David. From a bad one. <laughs> Everything I and how to successfully deliver a joke that you expect to be offensive. Because here's the thing, stuff like PewDiePie dressing in a soldier outfit and watching Hitler as a commentary on the media falsely calling him a racist, that makes sense. That joke works, when not taken out of context, of course, uh, Wall Street uh, Journal. But those two Fiverr videos that I talked about obviously didn't resonate for many people, including some of Felix's biggest supporters like Jacksepticeye, Cinnamon Toast Ken. I do not condone these types of jokes, whether they're in context or not. And honestly, me, and many other people in the digital industry that I've spoken to, Jewish and otherwise. So when is a joke not a joke? As PewDiePie himself in his response video said, But I would consider myself a rookie comedian. And in case all the puns and meme references haven't tipped you off, I'm not exactly setting the world on fire with my comedy either. So, oh, ouch. So I look through some past incidents of jokes that have gone too far to see if I can find a common thread to help creators like PewDiePie push the envelope without incurring the wrath of the masses. So, push the envelope that have gone too far. It's a film theory on the elements of comedy. And I've identified the five core problems that make PewDiePie's situation go horrendously wrong. Problem number one, it didn't play by joke rules. A lot of the people coming to the defense of PewDiePie are saying that this situation proves that political correctness has killed our ability to make jokes about offensive topics. I disagree. You can make jokes about anything, but the way that that joke is set up really matters set up and delivered and received. So let's consider two situations by comedians who made jokes about one of the most sensitive subjects possible. Rape. Told you I gave you that trigger warning at the beginning for a reason. In the first situation, com Okay, um, please don't. Like, generally, please don't. Comedian Daniel Tosh was performing a stand-up act in 2012 and told a few jokes about rape, prompting a woman in the audience to shout out, actually, rape jokes are never funny. Tosh replied to the interruption by saying, well, it sounds like she's been raped by five guys. One of the women in the audience wrote about the incident in a Tumblr post that went viral. Tosh received a ton of heat for the joke and ultimately apologized for his actions. In the second situation, Louis C.K. told this joke in a stand-up special in 2006. Not condoning rape, obviously. You should never... Uh, rape anyone, um, unless you have a reason, like you want to f somebody and they won't let you, in which case, uh, what other option do you have? Oh, well. Granted, this joke was told a few years before Tosh's, but there was no media firestorm, and in fact, a writer from Jezebel cited this joke as one of the right ways to make a rape joke in the aftermath of the Tosh controversy. Both jokes are made nonchalantly and are about a horrifying subject, so why does one deserve an apology and the other deserve praise? Well, nothing ruins a joke faster than analyzing it, so... Let's do that. Oh! Nothing ruins a joke uh, faster than analyzing it, so let's analyze that. Let's start with Louis C.K. Louis' joke follows a textbook joke setup. You have a simple premise, a turn on that premise, and finally a punchline. The setup was the simple declaration that you should never rape someone, something that presumably everyone in the audience is going to agree with. The turn on that premise then is that rape can be justified if it has a good reason. The thought that any good reason could exist to excuse it catches the audience by surprise. This is immediately followed by the punchline, meant to show the ridiculousness of the rationale that's behind the rape, a point that he further clarifies by the sarcastic rhetorical question, what other option do you have? The ultimate butt of this joke are males feeling entitled to sex. It's all really clear without explanation. The way he presents his comments follows a clear structure that we all implicitly recognize as a joke. Tosh's joke, though, is a bit less clear. And to be fair to him, part of it is because it's an ad-libbed response to someone yelling at him from the audience. The statement, well, it sounds like she's been raped by five guys, lacks the setup and turn that Louis' joke has. 
Oh, true. Let's just set up. Let's turn. And it's hard to see it as satirizing a particular idea. Instead, it ends up belittling a group of victims of one of the worst crimes imaginable. PewDiePie's situation is much more like that of Daniel Tosh's. He meant oh. to satirize what people would do for $5, but he chose to do it by belittling a group who suffered through one of the worst crimes in history. It also hurts because the inclusion of Jewish people is a complete non sequitur. All of a sudden, they're awkwardly used as the butt of a joke that never had any Thing to do with them in the first place. He's mixing a joke about race and ethnicity in with economic satire, and that's just creating a confusing mess. If PewDiePie truly wanted to satirize an economic system in which the rich can pay the destitute to do any number of terrible things that they want, he could have made that sign read any number of things, including leaving it just as subscribe to Keemstar, a frequent target on the channel, and a joke that everyone would have gotten because, I mean, come on, it's, it's Keemstar. But the joke failed in A, not setting up the premise clearly for the viewer early in the video, and B, not tying the conclusion back to the premise at the end. I really like it that Matt Pat have analyzed it to the point in which, um, to the point in which he can just say, subscribe, yeah, let's continue. The kind of things. It's like something that is, something that will lift up your mood a bit. Then go back down. There was no so what moment to connect the words on the sign back to the Fiverr site. Making a risky joke like that requires that all of those dots be connected. And if they are not crystal clear, then you're gonna have yourself an offended audience. Problem number two. You no, know, especially when the topic that the joke revolves around is very sensitive. If it's a light joke, uh, right, sure. Its source isn't seen as a comedian. YouTubers fall into a weird category. As in light joke, get it, get it. E goes MC square, light joke, get it, light, light. When it comes to how the world sees us. Felix, like all YouTubers, plays a role on his channel. In his case, it's a role called PewDiePie. But because it's YouTube and he's doing it on a face cam in a small, intimate room talking directly to us, it's often hard to see where PewDiePie ends and Felix begins. This is especially complicated when lots of his videos feature him talking openly to the camera, or others feature him flipping in and out of character. It's a very subtle line that all YouTubers draw because the performance is very much tied to who we are, and yet, to some degree, it's all still an act. And if it's a subtle difference to us, to outside viewers who don't watch YouTube all the time, well, then forget it. They have no clue what's going on. So now compare Felix's performance medium to that earlier Louis C.K. example. He's on stage in a theater with a spotlight and a microphone. This is clearly a performance. A clear performance. There's an artifice to this proceeding that signals the people, I'm watching a show where this guy is trying to entertain me. Everything he says for the next 90 minutes are all part of his act. And that distinction between performer and person is very important when you're trying to make jokes that push the envelope. While comedians have been known to get into hot water for insensitive Twitter jokes, the response can be multitudes worse for people who aren't comedians. Take the case of Justine Sacco. Sacco was flying from New York to South Africa in 2013 and tweeted the joke, Going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Justine Sacco Whoa. wasn't a comedian, just Whoa. a communications director for an internet media company. Irony for the win. And once a few people saw and shared that tweet around, the response got out of control. By the time Justine's plane landed in in South Africa, she was the number one trending topic on Twitter and would be fired from her job shortly afterward. Sacco was adamant that she was just joking, saying, To me, it was so insane of a comment for anyone to make. I thought there was no way anyone could possibly think it was literal. After a while, however, she started to see the distinction and understood why it was so easy for the internet to turn on her. Yes, uh, after a while, she was starting to notice. As the saying goes, Dang Juzha Mi, Pang Guang Zheng Qing. So if you are in the water, you will not be able to recognize it. Something like a, a frog in the boiling in the frog in the water, then frog in the pot, then slowly boil the water. Because they had Something no like reason to know that she was joking. Sacco ultimately made the point that, quote, unfortunately, I'm not a character on South Park or a comedian, so I had no business commenting on the epidemic in such a politically incorrect manner on a public platform. It's easy to draw parallels to PewDiePie here. If the masses don't see you as someone who is definitely making a joke, then what you say and what you do has a good chance of being taken quite literally. Problem number three, it seemed like it targeted the wrong people. A joke and a litter. As we talked about earlier, PewDiePie's intent- 
and was to highlight how ridiculous Fiverr is. But to an outside observer, it could be seen as an example of punching down. The comedic term for when someone with greater power or privilege makes fun of a more marginalized person or group. In joking about taboo topics, you're going to have a much easier time hitting the perpetrators or punching up rather than the victims or punching down. Any number of comedians and non-comedians have been criticized for punching down over the years. Just last year, Jesse Waters, a correspondent for Fox News' The O'Reilly Factor, was rebuffed by the internet for mocking residents of New York City's Chinatown for their responses about the presidential election. Among the problematic parts of the segment were instances in which Waters asked these people whether they knew karate, which is of course Japanese, and asked questions about the Chinese zodiac to people who likely didn't speak any English. Beyond having nothing to do with the Chinese Americans' thoughts on the presidential race, the segment was seen as a misuse of power by someone with relative wealth and privilege. In this case, a white yeah. American with a camera crew trying to poke fun at the historically marginalized minority group. Critics of PewDiePie's antics in the two Fiverr videos can make the same argument, that the video was exploitative to the funny guys, the young Indian men who wrote down and held up Pewd's message in the video, as well as Fiverr Jesus. After the backlash to PewDiePie, all of these Fiverr accounts were suspended, and the funny guys actually had to make a video to apologize for taking part. In the video, we find out that their knowledge of English isn't that complete and that they didn't actually know what the term Jews meant, but as you watch the video, something even worse becomes clear. These guys really need the money from that Fiverr account. They live in a rural part of India, a country that the World Bank estimated in 2011 had about 276 million people living on $1.25 or less per day. This and it got even worse during the global pandemic period, which is now. Right now is the global pandemic period. Same thing happened with HD Jesus. The good news here is that after PewDiePie intervened, both accounts, the Fiverr funny guys and Jesus, were reinstated. But the way he made them take part in a joke that they didn't even realize they were making makes this whole thing feel a bit exploitative. And it didn't help that in the follow-up update, he started the video by saying, It's PewDiePie again, the multimillionaire that keeps complaining about stuff. Then proceeded to complain about losing $500 in his quest to help the banned accounts. I mean, it's great, but I want my $500 back. Problem number four, the joke. You're, gosh, you're a multi-millionaire. You, you, you stated it, multi-millionaire. And a punch out and punching yourself itself is contradictory. At the end of the first video, PewDiePie expresses shock that they made the sign at all, and then says that he couldn't be held responsible, which seems a bit tone deaf. You paid people across the world to do something that you considered shocking, and they did it. So, of course you're responsible. Own up to the joke. He also says that he's not proud of what the video contained, but if he really believed the message was particularly offensive, he still had the power to not upload the video in the first place. In oh, you can just edit it out. Instead, he went on and did the complete opposite, he did numerous more, having Jesus say, just When you are in control of such variables, you can't just say that oh, it's, out of, it's out of my control. I can't do anything about it. When you are in control of such variables. I just want to let you all know that Hitler did absolutely nothing wrong. And then again with Tyrone. Hitler did nothing wrong. So his actions don't line up with what he's saying. It's easy to see how a lot of people would construe this incident as PewDiePie taking advantage of someone below him, in this case the Fiverr funny guys, to say something shocking and then hide behind the idea of, hey, I'm not the one who held up the sign. But it's also contradictory within PewDiePie's own videos. In his series YouTube High School, which satirizes online video trends, PewDiePie actively condemns online pranksters and their habit of doing awful things and then justifying their actions by saying, it's just a prank, bro. What kind of would do that just for personal views and gains? To quote from the song contained in that episode, Can't you people understand that it's just comedy? It's f***ing funny. That's why it's okay. But with the Fiverr situation, PewDiePie was basically just saying the same thing. It's just a joke, that's what makes it okay. The situation is parallel, right down to the- No, to, to different people, different audience, di different receivers, it's... For you, it might be good. For me, it, for me, it might be bad. For me, it might be good. For you, it might be bad. Hey, for, for both of us, it might be good. But for someone else, it might be bad. Similarly, for someone else, it might be good. For, for both of us, it might be bad. The general cause of the majority is let's be understanding, let's be open-minded, and let's be respectful towards one another, one another's boundaries, right? The line in the 
common knowledge. Song, I got you fired. Just a prank, bro. As that's exactly what happened to the Fiverr accounts. And problem number five, it stops being a joke when it has consequences outside of itself. Here are some other quote-unquote punchlines that could have appeared on that sign. As much as I identify with PewDiePie's desire to have freedom over his message and to not be taken out of context, any one of those phrases isn't, quote, just a funny meme as he claims at the end of his video. Okay, so don't get the wrong idea. It was a funny meme and I didn't think it would work, okay? Because a meme is something that gets repeated and imitated. Dabbing, was up, Legend 27. And although he says his actions aren't normalizing hate, science would disagree. Calling no. for the death of any group of people based on one shared trait would be the most dangerous meme out there. In 2001, the study Low Involvement Learning, Repetition and Coherence and Familiarity and Belief, super exciting title I know, found that repeated exposure to phrases gets people more likely to believe them. Wow, I isn't that a recency effect? Isn't that uh okay? If it's something close to it, will be recency effect. If it's mere exposure effect, if, if it's cognitive in, uh, dissonance. Sorry. There. In two thousand. What is it? Low involvement learning, repetitions and coherence and familiarity and belief. Two thousand one. The study low involvement learning, repetition and coherence and familiarity and belief. Wow, this is a very very long title. I'm gonna I'm gonna memorize it. All right. Low involvement learning, repetitions and coherence, familiarity and belief. Super exciting title I know, found that repeated exposure to phrases gets people more likely to believe them. Case and points, the very fact that I can interact with you in English, but I'm incapable of speaking the Russian language, I'm incapable of speaking the Italian language, I, I'm incapable of speaking hundreds, thousands of different languages, it's because no one in my surroundings for the past few decades have spoken them have used them. So... In 2009, Sparks, Pelletia, and Irvine published a study that showed how news outlets covered a story on UFOs greatly impacted whether viewers believed in the existence of UFOs. Influence, influence, influence. Another 2009 study found similar results for science TV news and how it affected people's scientific beliefs. And countless studies including perceived source variability versus familiarity to Perceived source variability, oh sorry. Perceived source uh, variability versus familiarity. Testing competing explanations for the truth effect. Testing competing explanations for the truth effect, try saying that one 10 times fast, wow. have shown that repeated phrases are believed more. In other words, repeating the phrase, Hitler did nothing wrong, multiple times in multiple videos, actually psychologically reinforces the idea that Hitler did nothing wrong in your mind. Yes, what he says is true. If you repeat it something, multiple different times, psychological reinforcements into it. And if you misuse this power, this if you misuse this knowledge, it can end up bad. That is scientific fact. I could continue citing long, verbose, really boring scientific article titles, but long story short, as much as it sucks, words matter, Felix, especially when you're influencing an audience of 50 million. So what's the solution? I would say that it's humor, but humor done right. Science has shown that humor is the most effective means of reaching those whose beliefs differ from our own. If we're able to laugh, then we're willing to listen. George Carlin forever changed the way societies look at taboo words with his seven words you can't say on TV routine. Shows like Will and Grace and Modern Family portrayed comedic gay couples in mainstream media and educated while they entertained. When the entire Western world challenged one another to pour ice buckets over themselves in a silly gag, prompting those same individuals to learn about a not-so-sexy little-known disease, it was a game-changer. According to Steven Rosenfield, founder and director of the American Comedy Institute, quote, there's a pattern in stand-up comedy. It starts with certain groups or minorities, immigrants, blacks, women, old people, Jews, Muslims, gays, Arabs, Asians, being the target of stereotypical jokes. In response, people from the target group will start doing stand-up comedy themselves. When the audience sees one of these new comedians on stage talking about themselves with a sense of humor, they begin to recognize how dimensional the stereotyped group is. If yes, it's not just black and white, it's not just two dimensional. These indiv individuals have different layers. They know how to make us laugh, there's a connection, a cultural crossover. The original stereotype will start breaking down, making it harder to perpetuate. End quote. We need people like PewDiePie to continue pushing boundaries, tackling taboo or risque topics, because humor is a force for good, the voice of generation. 
dance correctly. Laughing is a force for positive change. But with any form of comedy, sometimes a joke just doesn't go over well. George Carlin was banned for years because his work was so edgy. And sometimes a joke just doesn't land. I mean, I've seen plenty of amateur stand-up comedy nights, and if you want to try not to cringe challenge, oh, oh, that is ultimate edition. And honestly, that's what happened with PewDiePie and the Fiverr videos. Why those were so offensive to so many people, while all his other past videos haven't been. What truly matters here is that risky humor needs to be humor done right. It needs Risky humor needs to be humor done right. If you do it wrongly, it can backfire pretty quickly. You in hot to have a clear and thoughtful purpose because that's when it's at its most powerful in the words of humorist Mary Hirsch humor is a rubber sword it allows you to make a point without drawing blood but hey that's oh and as a funny side note dear everyone who is attacking Disney on Twitter for their decision to drop PewDiePie by posting stills of this old Donald Duck cartoon saying that Disney is a hypocrite because they have anti-semitic history well those images are from a World War II era propaganda cartoon in which Donald has a nightmare about being in Nazi Germany. It's not meant to be a good thing in the original cartoon. In other words, removing these images to prove Disney's anti-Semitic history is doing the exact same thing that the Wall Street Journal did to PewDiePie. You've taken it out of its context. And sure, yeah. Walt had all his issues and whatever, but in this instance, I just thought you'd all appreciate the irony. And hey, here's <laughs> one final funny meme to leave you with. Death to all the subscribe buttons. Kill all the subscribe buttons by clicking right there on that horrendously <laughs> offensive sign. And if you want even more reasons to hate the mainstream media, click right over here. That video will give you plenty of fodder for your Twitter rants. Now, if you'll excuse me, it is way past due to end this episode. Thank you all so much for sticking with me through what is going to be a very long video. But remember, it's all just a theory, a film theory, and cut. Thank you so much for being so understanding. And let's be welcoming to everyone, respectful and be polite. Thank you all so much for watching this together. Uh, thank you so much for thank you so much for watching this video together with me. I hope that you enjoyed this video as much as I did. Hope that you learned a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much. If you do like this video, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to my channel and comment down below if you have any extra thoughts. Don't forget to follow my channel and I sincerely appreciate all the support. And genuinely, honestly, really motivating, and encouraging. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in my next video. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. Thanks for watching. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye-bye.